So that's certainly a title, isn't it? It feels really weird. You've got the serious and foreboding first bit, you know, disaster report, and then a calm and pleasant second bit in summer memories. Feels a bit at odds with itself, really. But this ain't the review of the title of a game. Though if it was, that would free up so much time in my day, my rubbish won't take itself out after all. Today's topic is another from my bin of games that I bought ages ago and never got around to covering. A bin that I'm at least making a dent in now, which is always nice. This game came out in 2018, and it was a game I was convinced to buy because I found its demo to be rather interesting. By the way, like, share and subscribe. Also, check out my Patreon for updates and consider becoming a patron if you want to support the channel. There, now we can press on, as I was saying about a demo. I do want to take a moment to praise those out there who still give us demos, though I can see why many companies don't. After all, if Funny Truck had a demo, it'd be like 10 seconds long and it would have effectively informed me not to buy that tosh. Anyway, let's look at Disaster Report 4 Summer Memories. What is Disaster Report 4 Summer Memories? Well, Disaster Report 4 Summer Memories, and I swear to god that's the last time I typed that out in full, is a game set in a city in Japan that was recently devastated by a huge earthquake. You play as a random player who's on the bus heading to the city to... quickly look through a list of options, the game thrust upon me, attend a job interview. I'm not sure why we have to make this choice, but I'm sure it'll make sense later, won't it, game? Game, it'll make sense later, right? Why aren't you meeting my gays, game? Anyway, the earthquake happens, but we manage to survive. We crawl from the wreckage of the bus and step out into the devastated streets, getting a look at all the confused, hurt people wandering around aimlessly and trying to figure out what we have to do next. Now, what kind of game are you, DR4? Um, I don't know. Action adventure? <laughs> no, but seriously, what are you? No, seriously, I'm, I'm an action adventure. Google it. Okay, bear with me. Huh. Alright then. So there's this critic called Yahtzee Croshaw, or Zero Punctuation, he's a game reviewer. And I remember him saying something about action adventure games, or at least action adventure as a genre. It's basically a way of a game saying, we don't know what the fuck this is. And I'll be buggered if I haven't started seeing things from his perspective. Okay game, I guess you're an action adventure, let's go and see what that translates to this time around. Seriously, a third person shooter tells you the game is a shooter from the third person. An open world RPG tells you the game is open world and a role playing game. A walking simulator tells you that the game is focused around walking, what the fuck am I supposed to expect from action adventure. It's such a vague term. Chill, girl, just have a play and you'll see exactly what I am. Okay, fine, I'll chill and play the game, and I promise that's the last time I do whatever the fuck accent that was for the game. So once we're free from the bus, we're given full control. We can now walk slowly around the map. Really slowly. Like, so slowly it reminds me of how I used to trail a mile behind everyone when I went to PE class. There is a run button, it's R1. Why does this game need a separate run button? Fucked if I know. There are very few moments in the game where you won't want to run around. Only time to avoid it is when the ground starts shaking because otherwise you'll fall flat on your face and take some health damage. But when the ground does shake, it's easy enough to just stop, get on all fours for a few seconds and all is sorted. The main gameplay is based around wandering around, bumping into characters to trigger interactions where you choose dialogue, and then doing it again. There's rarely if ever any sort of indication as to which characters you're actually supposed to talk to in order to progress the story, so get used to wandering around aimlessly because it's most of what you'll be doing. This feels like one of those games that will manage to draw a long playtime out just because the player's confused for hours. Eventually, after I had spoken to a man on a park bench, then a dickhead in a suit at a car company, and then finally a teacher who needed me to find her students, I was shown the way forward. You might ask, what is the primary goal of the game? What is our character's motivation? Is it to get out of the city and return home? Is it to play the role of the humanitarian and save everyone you can? Is it to be a crafty thief who uses the devastation of the situation to profit in any way they can? Well, that's kind of your call for the most part, though I do keep getting the impression that the primary overhanging goal is to actually get the fuck out of the city. Here's the thing though, I play games like this in a specific way, that way being if someone needs help I will help them. I feel bad if I disappoint video game characters. It's weird, I'm never worried about disappointing real people. This is how I wound up solving an arson case and carrying an old lady to a hospital when I should be focused on fleeing the dangerous city. We're still getting constant aftershocks, everything is still collapsing, and some bits of the city are sinking. Why the fuck would we stick around? Well, because I want to play the good guy, apparently. Even if I may have fucked up a little bit by joining a cult. Yeah, at one point in the game there are these dudes in white who greet you and take you to their little cult compound. And it seems like this is the only way to move forward, narrative-wise. So I end up recruiting about 12 people and becoming the cult leader for some reason. I was like, wait, what? I kept getting moral points for bringing people into the cult though, which made me feel a bit uncomfortable. Cults typically don't have their moral compass pointed in the correct direction, but anyway. I've lost the plot a bit was my point, and I think the game did too. It seemed to just pull little random side stories out of thin air, and it really felt like the game was just making shit up as it went along. Is this perhaps a clever storytelling practice, as we, an outsider, drift around this unfamiliar city and discover the complexities of the many lives here, seeing people far along in their own stories that we cannot hope to fully comprehend? Or did the writers just make shit up as they went along and hoped we wouldn't notice? Either one might be true, I'm a cynic though, so I vote option B. I haven't said much on the gameplay because it's rather minimal. You run around the streets and talk to peeps, occasionally you eat a sandwich and gargle 
guzzle down some juice to keep yourself from getting too hungry or thirsty. And remember to use the bathroom. What is this, the fucking Sims? No, no, man. We just wanted to be immersive and we figured making you need to eat, drink and wee all the time is the right way to go. Yeah, DR4, that doesn't make the game immersive. In your case, it adds basically nothing. Food is easy to come by, water too, and bathrooms are everywhere, so it's not really a survival element. It's not about carefully managing resources. It's just about throwing random survival elements in for the hell of it, it seems. Though I should say, the one element I found kind of interesting was the stress mechanic. See, when you get knocked over by a quake or submerge yourself in cold, dirty water or do anything else stressful, your stress goes up. I know that sounds complex, but stay with me here, people. And as your stress goes up, it lowers your maximum HP. In theory, this is an interesting mechanic. We have to keep our character calm, try to remain in control of a situation that's so beyond us. The catch is that I only ever found this stress thing to be an issue maybe once in the entire game. Eating a sandwich will reduce your stress, so will drinking some juice or just resting at one of the many, many save points dotted around the map. What's more is your health and stress levels will always reset when you reach a new map. So if you are having trouble, you just gotta make progress and all will be fine. Though the catch there is you'll have to actually be able to figure out the way forward. Sometimes it can be a bit obtuse. I'm now going to provide two instances of when figuring out the way forward was at its most annoying. One of them was early on. We need to find our way to a pier, but a truck and some rubble blocks the road ahead. What would you do in this scenario? Climb over the truck and rubble, right? Or maybe you'd go into the adjacent office building and climb out of a ground floor window to get to the other side. No, stupid. What you're actually meant to do is impersonate a CEO's daughter, get the one remaining staff member in said office building to give you a letter and 30,000 yen. No, sorry, 300,000 yen. Blimey, that's even worse than I thought. Then head across the street to a convenience store, buy the key to the toilet for 100,000 yen, and then climb out the bathroom window and this somehow makes progress. Later, you need to cross some train tracks so you and your companion can reach a part of the city. We can't go back the way we came due to floods and blockage, fair enough. Again, what would you do? Probably just climb over the tiny piles of rubble and press on, right? No, wrong, double stupid. What you actually need to do is move a piece of rubble using two extra people. To do this, you need to find a couple whose kid's teddy bear is stuck inside the collapsed house, row to the far end of the house to get inside, and then crawl through the rubble to save the toy. Does this award us the manpower we need? No, wrong again, triple stupid. Only one of the two parents will help, we need one more. So we have to now save a man collapsed under a house by going back and forth to look for a jack to lift some rubble that he's trapped under, and only then will someone agree to help us. Fuck, because apparently our character will only do a pull-up or a dainty hop when she feels like it. So many obstacles in this game could have been so easily overcome by someone with two working limbs, but apparently not. Look, I don't mind helping these folks out, but the arbitrary way in which the game forces us to do so, well, it ain't exactly immersive fun. In general, I found the game really hard to get into. Partly it was the stiff character models that couldn't out-emote a Dalek. Partly it was the dialogue and how it seems that a lot of the Japanese text might have been directly translated. Either that or it was just weirdly written. Maybe that's just me though. I didn't find the game to be particularly entertaining on any front. I kind of liked exploring the devastated city, but the novelty of that wore off fast. The game flows like an uphill river of bricks. Every time we open a door, we fade into this one animation of us opening a door, walking through stiffly and then the door closing behind us. All the menus look so generic, the cutscenes with characters were slow and poorly animated, and even on the PS5, the load times were a bit on the long side. Not intolerable, but not very good either. Music is alright, I suppose. To be honest, the game just isn't great. I liked the setup to a point, and there was some delightful tension here and there, not knowing when the next earthquake was coming. But eventually I figured out a formula for this. The only really seemed to happen when we're making progress. Typically they happen so that we can continue to make progress, because they'll knock stuff out of the way for us. How kind of you, Earthquake-chan. The barriers that impede our progress are so arbitrary. Most of them are just slightly elevated roads that a single pull-up would get us over. A pull-up that our character could easily do because she fucking does it elsewhere. The models seem a bit off as well. There's this one scene at the pier where a character gets crushed to death, only the animators completely forgot to make any of the rubble actually touch the dude. There's this huge gap between him and the big heavy thing, it's like a bad play. Sometimes you'd have invisible walls to protect you from death drops, other times you wouldn't for reasons, I suppose. There was this one bit where we got a scooter for like 90 seconds before the road collapses and we're walking again. It's a shame, I was liking the idea of maybe the world opening up a bit from this point on and us being given more freedom to explore, that would have been cool. I should quickly point out the moral choice element, I alluded to the idea of moral points earlier, there's also immoral points for when you do naughty stuff. Really, I think I should have been getting the immoral points points for making people join a cult. Truth is though, I never saw it making an impact. People cared more about how you behaved to them in the moment. So why the game keeps score of your moral points, I don't know. Maybe it's just for you so you can see what a lovely person or what a shithead you are. All in all, DR4 is just not a very good game. 
I liked what it was trying to be, I just think it executed it poorly. I guess I can see how it's an action adventure, sort of. Well, the adventure part anyway, the most action worthy moment I had was when I was slowly jogging away from the cult members. When I saw this game in my library, I wondered why I never got round to covering it, but now I know. It's because it's just kind of bad. Not the worst game I've played, it's nowhere near that bad. If anything, it's just a very mediocre sort of bad that's not even fun to get worked up about. Maybe if the game had some more fluid animations and maybe a quest journal to help us keep track of what the fuck we're doing. Also some language options so I don't have to read subtitles for the entire game, though that's definitely a me problem, I'm just a bad reader. I only watched a dubbed anime after all. Maybe if it had these changes I might have liked it a little bit more. Disaster Report 4 is just not for me, but you know what, that's fine. I don't need every game to be for me. We can go our separate ways now, Disaster Report. Report 4. I don't hate you, I just don't really care about you.